Hi everyone, my name is Joe Barnard. This is the Scout D1 rocket, and as a quick disclaimer at the front of this video, this is not the most exciting flight by far. It's pretty standard. There's nothing super crazy about it. Um, if you're here for crazy experimental stuff like the Falcon Heavy, this may not be your video. Uh, I feel like it's important for me to just document all the progress that's going on, uh, and sometimes that means videos that just aren't as crazy as a landing test or a Falcon Heavy. So let's get started. Okay, cool, so we're all set now. And I did mention that this isn't an exciting flight, but did you see it? Did you look real close? Let's play the launch again and see if you can see it. Mm, one more time, just a little bit zoomed in. It's a deer. <laughs> I scared the crap out of a deer on the launch field. Um, I didn't even see it because it was so dark, but just so we're, you know, get this out of the way, if you're a deer watching this right now, I'm so sorry. I just, I really deeply apologize. I did not do a good job as range safety officer. Um, anyway, okay, apart from the deer, let's get into the actual stuff of the flight. So the motor was an Apogee F10. That's an ammonium perchlorate composite propellant motor, which is, for obvious reasons, more commonly referred to as just APCP. Um, it's a great motor by Apogee Components. Um, again, this is stuff is not sponsored, but it burns for about seven seconds with an average of 10 newtons. Um, and that got the rocket up to about 60 meters in height. For all the good things that the F10 is, it is actually kind of hard to ignite. Um, so there's an igniter in this solid propellant motor, and as the chamber is coming up to pressure on the launch pad, it's very easy for it to expel that igniter without, you know, supporting a full ignition of the propellant. And what that just means is basically we had a misfire, the sun got a little bit lower, it got a little bit darker out, and that's why it's so dark. So I mentioned earlier that the rocket went up to about 60 meters above ground level, and this is great news because it means we crossed the Barnard line. Hey Joe, what's the Barnard line? What a great question. All right, so there's this star called the Barnard star, or just Barnard's star, discovered or at least named after Edwin, is that correct? Edward Emerson Barnard. I'm sorry, Edward, I got your name wrong. Um, the star is 5.958 light years away from Earth, and so if you move the decimal place once and then turn it into meters, you get 59.58 meters. So I can't cross the Kármán line, which is the official line of space with any of my rockets. I need some other line to shoot for. So we just got above the Barnard line of 59.58 meters. Okay, so all memes and jokes aside, we've got a couple of questions here. So first, why did the rocket tilt over when it launched? You'll notice that it was pretty stable, um, yet it was not at an upright orientation, but rather pitched over as it, you know, just continued upward. So there's actually an interesting reason for this, and I've mentioned this in a couple of different videos, but we have to look at how the signal flight computer actually obtains orientation measurements. We won't go all the way into the weeds here, because it gets real boring real quick, but Essentially, what we do is we resolve pitch and yaw on the vehicle by looking at the gravity vector on the accelerometers. And what this basically looks like is you just look for where gravity is pointed on all three axes. However, these are little MEMS accelerometers, which means they're very tiny. The whole sensor package with the accelerometers and gyroscopes can fit on the tip of my index finger. So because these accelerometers are pretty sensitive to changes in temperature and just different environmental factors, let's give a hypothetical scenario where your apartment in Nashville, Tennessee is 70 degrees and you calibrate the accelerometers inside there and then you bring the rocket out to the launch site where it is 40 degrees or something that's much less than 70 degrees. Um, that's essentially where all of this error comes from. So while the vehicle is on the pad, it thinks that it's not quite upright. However, this alone is not quite the problem. To better understand where this little error comes from, we need to take a look at the guts of the system, the Signal R2 flight computer. We'll start by booting up the computer here. So now that the computer is on and in the pad idle mode, I've connected to it with the Bluetooth app and we'll go into sensors and just take a look at what's going on. We have our accelerometer measurements, we have our gyroscope measurements, and our orientation measurements coming in live. So the vehicle understands itself to be pretty much on course at about zero by zero on the X and Y axis off the launch pad. And just to get everyone familiar, if you aren't already, I do this about a thousand times a day, uh, but we'll simulate a fake launch profile here. So here we go, three, two, one. Okay, cool. So we're in the thrust vectoring mode now, and if I tilt the computer one way or the other, it tries to correct for the orientation of the vehicle. And so we'll just demonstrate this a little bit. I'll jerk it down to simulate burnout. 
There we go. And we're going to finish out the profile here. Sometimes it takes a little while for safety reasons. There we go. So now we're moving the data from the flash chip to the SD card for easier access when you get the rocket back on the ground. And in just a second, it should finish. There it is. Great. So I'll reboot the computer now and we'll demonstrate something else here. Once again, I've connected to the computer with my phone, but this time what we're going to do is we're going to launch the rocket at an angle. So I'm going to start to pitch it over a little bit and you'll see all of these averaged accelerometer measurements starting to affect our orientation on the x-axis as we creep up to 16, uh, almost 17 degrees here on the x-axis. So I'm going to launch the rocket in 3, 2, 1. And what you'll notice here is that the vehicle is actually trying to remain at this pitched over orientation, which is interesting. If I go back to upright, it tries to correct back to that 17 or 16 degree angle. Now, this might look like a weird error or just a uh, negligent thing on my part, but let's jerk it down. There we go. That's burnout. And let's think about why this actually happens. Okay, cool. Our flight profile is finished. Once again, we're going to reboot. Okay, great. <laughs> Let me connect to it with my phone here. So once again, I've connected to the computer with my phone. Um, and instead of going into the sensors tab, we're going to go into the thrust vectoring tab. And what you will see is there's this little bit of text that says course correction. So what is course correction? Well, if the rocket launches at an angle, you might want to have it correct back to upright as it's ascending. Um, this is helpful if you're launching on like a windy day and you want to try to counteract that wind or things like that. Um, so, course correction fixes that. However, it's not turned on, which means that if you launch at an angle, Signal is going to try its best to hold that course. And it knows that angle because of those accelerometers on the launch pad. Now we're almost home here. Let's just demonstrate what course correction does. So here we go. I'm going to turn it on. Course correction is on now. We're going to go back into sensors. I'm going to pitch over this vehicle just like last time. We're going to let it average out for just a little bit. Give it a second or two. And okay, great. We're at a seriously pitched over angle. I've set the course correction uh, rate at about 20 degrees per second. And I think I set the start time at about three seconds after launch. So we're going to launch the rocket. And once it hits about three seconds into flight, it's going to start to make little correction maneuvers to try to get the computer pointed back upright. So here we go. Three, two, one. Okay, so it's holding the course. And then we're slowly starting to correct. We've got a gimbal angle. And as I turn the computer back to upright, there we go. So now the rocket is traveling straight up again. And if I were to have it be at that pitched over angle, it wouldn't like it very much. Okay. So now simulate burnout and we do not need to finish this flight profile. So I'm just going to cut ahead here. So if you haven't already connected the dots in your head, let me try to bring it home here. We had a miscalibration on the accelerometer on the vehicle and that alone should not have been a problem because once it launched, it should have tried to hold that orientation. However, I did have course correction turned on on the vehicle for about one second into flight. And that is kind of where we see that pitch over once the vehicle launches. So the course correction actually worked against the purpose of itself. Um, anyway, this is not, none of these are like huge errors. None of these are big problems. Um, it's just interesting to dig into the data as deep as you can and like figure out where exactly things go wrong and where you find these little anomalies. Um, something that someone mentioned to me um, the other day was you should analyze your successes to the same scrutiny that you analyze your failures. So I would definitely classify this as a successful flight, but it's important to still dig into that data to see why was it successful and where it could have failed if things went a little differently. The only other weird thing from this flight is that you might notice a little bit of a kick from the motor off the pad. Um, this is actually both a thrust kick and a TVC kick. So the F10 motor has a thrust spike of about 30 newtons, which is three times its average thrust. And that means any TVC movement will automatically be a lot stronger than it normally would. And the second part is that I actually did test a little bit of experimental code to try and start thrust vector control system just a little bit earlier off the launch pad. Um, the code obviously failed because it kicked the rocket pretty hard but it was not a flight critical thing. I was just sort of experimenting and that's why you see that kick there. But apart from those two things, this is a totally nominal flight. So let's look at some cool data. Here's a plot of the battery voltage, which goes down during flight just a little bit as the servos pull power from the flight computer to vector the thrust of the motor. 
I'm also pretty sure, not 100% sure, but I'm, I'm like pretty sure that you can see drag on the vehicle as it's ascending up to uh, cross the Barnard line. So if you look at the Z-axis acceleration measurements, you see this big thrust spike at the beginning of the burn, and it tapers off to around 10 newtons, but it does sort of have this little bathtub curve. It has a little dip in it. And that pretty closely matches the flight simulation that I ran before launching this vehicle. Um, we only see about like one to three newtons of drag on the top of the rocket, but that's still significant enough with a low thrust to weight ratio, like a 10 newton thrust force on a rocket that's about a kilogram. Um, basically, we, basi we just see this tiny little dip in the acceleration measurements. I don't know, it's cool data. It's all cool data to me. The last really cool thing you can see here is the active cooling of the vehicle through the temperature sensors. So that's right, Signal does have active cooling, which is a really fancy and overkill way of me saying, there's a big wind hole in that there rocket. If you look at this temperature data in a plot here, it actually drops as the vehicle is in flight, moving air through the airframe. It's not super significant, but you can see that as the vehicle is moving up, the temperature is dropping as air is moving over the computer and cooling it off. Anyway, that's about it for this flight. I hope you found these things interesting. I kind of like the idea that even if it's not some type of big groundbreaking thing or crazy landing test that I can still post these flights and find some interesting data out of it. It's certainly interesting for me and I hope the same is true for you. Once again, this flight and the last one of the Scout D1 rocket are part of a test campaign that we've been running on the Signal R2 flight computer and thrust vectoring system. I think at this point, most people here know what the Signal thrust vectoring kit is, but if you don't, there's a link in the description down below. And if you have questions about it or just thoughts, you can always reach out on the contact form on the website. That is by far the most effective way to contact me. I want to give a really big thank you to all of the folks who really generously support BPS.Space on Patreon. I've said this before, but once again, none of this stuff would be possible without them. There's this sort of phenomenon on YouTube when you post videos, you always want your latest video to be better than all of the last ones. Um, and I can sort of feel a little less stress um, because of the support from folks there. Now, before I sign off here, I have an interesting problem that I need some help solving. This is the problem. These are six fully functional, ready to go sets of landing legs. Rubber bands, the screw holes to mount them in a 74 millimeter airframe. Um, each set of landing legs comes with an extra strut and an extra leg. Um, they're ready to go. I'm gonna give these all away for free and I don't know how to do it. How do I pick who gets these legs? We could do six, one to each individual person. We could do a photo contest. We could do, I, I honestly have no idea. Um, so this is not the contest itself. I just have these legs ready to go. I want to give them away. How do I do it? Anyway, that's the problem. That's, this is the end of the video. Um, my name's Joe Barnard. Thanks for tuning in. May your skies be blue and your wind be low.